Uh, well, I, I haven't seen this book before, actually, and I'm giving a lecture on it, so it's quite interesting, isn't it? <laughs> they only arrived this afternoon, so I've only just seen this book, uh, and what a marvellous book it is. <laughs> uh, I must say, I'm quite lucky to be here um, this evening because I drove off from home in plenty of time, and I got to the other side of Hyde Park, and all the traffic suddenly stopped because there was a fire in the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. I, I accosted a policeman who said, well, sir, you'll, you'll just have to run across the park then, won't you? So I didn't realise that to be physically fit was very important to actually give this lecture. So I, I was fortunate that I've been practising my running in Battersea Park. Anyway. So this work attributed to Shankara. We've called it the Eternal Way. There was a huge debate about the title. And when we started to translate it, we thought no one had ever translated this text before. We were convinced. We had searched the internet. But uh, after a year, we were just finishing the last verse, and my wife, who uh, is a dab hand at the iPad, uh, we only translate these things when we're on holiday. I think we were in some exotic location. I've forgotten where. She was tapping away on the iPad and put in the Sanskrit of the last verse, and up comes a translation by a Swamini. Swamini Vimalananda. And she had done a most beautiful translation. The trouble was that it was very, very difficult to get a copy of this text. But we then realised we needed to go through her whole text, and we spent another year... Uh, of holiday time, going through that text, and uh, it was marvellous. We didn't alter our translation very much, I'm glad to say, but I must say we are slightly indebted to Swamini Vimalananda. But I challenge anyone to get a hold of a copy of that text. It'll be very difficult. So I, it's good we've now got this version, and we've attempted to make it as accessible as possible to a Western audience. Uh, so, hopefully, if I look inside, you'll see that it's got all the Sanskrit laid out nicely there, thanks to Mrs. Harper and Mrs. Anik Hardacre and others. So, a lot of work has gone into this text. So, I think, let's start by hearing some of this text, shall we? Let's hear some of the Sanskrit. Om Sad. Chirananda Kandaya Jagadam Kurahetawe Sadoditaya Purnaya Namonantaya Vishnawe A bow to the limitless, all pervasive, rooted in being, consciousness, and bliss the cause of the sprouting of this universe, ever-flourishing and complete. Sarva Vedanta Siddhantair Gratitang Nirmalang Shivam Sadacharam Pravakshyami Yoginang Jana Siddhaye I shall teach the taintless and auspicious eternal way which is paved with the teachings of all the Upanishads. In this way, those seeking union may attain the higher knowledge. Pratah smarami devasya Savitur bharga atmanah varinyantati yo yo nash chedanande prachodayat. Early in the morning, I remember that excellent radiance of the divine sun that is myself. May that self energize our meditations on the bliss of consciousness. And of course, the very first words are Sat Chit Ananda. 
being, consciousness, and bliss. And this room, this city, this nation, this globe, this universe is full of sat, chit, ananda, being, consciousness, and bliss, and nothing else. This is the message of Advaita, of non-duality. It is rooted in being, consciousness, and bliss, and all the forms which we seem to perceive are flourishing, but they are complete, and they are rooted only in being, consciousness, and bliss. They are only being, consciousness, and bliss. This is the great message right from verse 1 of this text. Okay, so you're wondering now, come on, Jessup, get on with this. Um, What's this text really about? Tell us what's new about it. Come on. Yes, and I did wonder about this. What is new about this text? Of course, I dare say here there are most people probably have, have read some texts on Advaita. Could you raise your hand, and don't worry if this is the case, uh, just for my information, is there, are there people here who have never read any texts on non-duality, never come across it before? Oh, right, everyone has come across some text on non-duality, so I'm preaching to the converted here. But nevertheless, so you're keen to know what's different about this text. I'm going to tell you in one word, vritti, vritti. Now, you may not be that much wiser uh, at that (laughs) point, but (laughs) uh, that is what's new. And that word contains the whole teaching. It is the whole teaching. Interested? (laughs) So what is this word? Well, there's just one problem. We can't really translate it. (laughs) Uh, It's almost impossible to translate this word, and if you look it up in the dictionary, you won't be that much wiser. Okay, a few clues. It comes from a seed form, vrit, which means to turn. So vritti is really a turning. It's used, for example, of a tear rolling down the cheek. And that tear turns. So it's as simple as that. It's fairly basic. Ah, but in this text, it's really talking about a turning of the mind. Chitta vritti, as it's called. This turning of the mind is rather important in philosophy because this turning of the mind enables us to perceive things. This is called the theory of perception. And I learnt about it, or rather, I was supposed to have learnt about it at university. I attended lectures, I remember, it was about maybe two, three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. And I was taught by an extremely erudite, lovely man, um, an Indian gentleman who was very softly spoken. He was a world expert in the field. But I must say, I did quite a bit nod off. So I didn't really hear very much. So. If you want a little kip, now's the time to do it, because I warn you, warn you, this subject is a little challenging. So, how does this work? The vritti is when the mind encompasses or pervades an object. Here we are, here's an object. And my attention is pervading this object, and this is the vritti, the turning. I can see some people yawning already, marvellous. It's having having the desired effect. (laughs) My attention is going out 
and it's enveloping, pervading this object. This is the vritti. And this is happening all the time. The only reason why you think you're seeing me is because of the vritti. Your attention is, as, is, as it were, going out, enveloping the object, and that dispels your ignorance about the object, the body of Warwick Jessup, or this book, or whatever it is. This is the vritti. The thought, and I'm, oh, I've used that word, thought. This is, I'm afraid, the word we've used to translate vritti. It's a very unfortunate word, but it's the best we could find in the English language. We have translated vritti as thought. The thought, the vritti, pervades the object. All right? This is the theory of perception. Aha! But there's one other thing. You don't only need the vritti for Warwick Jessup to see that book. I also need the consciousness reflecting in Warwick Jessup's mind. If I have both, if I have the vritti, and if I have the consciousness reflecting in Warwick Jessup's mind, I can see the book or any other object. With it so far? Happy? Yes, okay. There are three verses in this text on this subject. The first says, thought takes the form of the object. Vritti takes the form of the object. The object is lit by the reflected consciousness. Very important. So we have two things. We have the vritti and we have the reflected consciousness which enables me to see that book. Now comes the killer verse. Hold on to your seats. Be prepared to be shocked. Let thought alone prevail. Now, I, never, I bet you never thought you were going to hear that in a philosophy lecture, did you? Let thought alone prevail. The trouble is that word thought, of course. Let vritti alone prevail. Then there is no reflected consciousness. Let thought alone prevail. Then there is no reflected consciousness. Now practice this now. Let the vritti, let that simple vritti, that turning, take place without the individual mind interfering. Without the reflected consciousness. Actually, we've been working on this for decades. This is spiritual practice. It's all the spiritual practices we have had. And it took us about two years to realize that. Uh, because it absolutely stumped us. But this is shockingly simple. But once the penny drops, the life transforms. Because no longer will you indulge in that reflected consciousness. You let the vritti alone prevail. This is the key to self-realization. This is what this has to offer. Let the vritti alone prevail. Then there is no reflected consciousness. And it explains why. For consciousness, the self, is self-luminous and self-evident. For consciousness, the self, is self-luminous and self-evident. In other words, there's no need for Warwick, Warwick Jessup's consciousness or any, any individual's consciousness. The absolute consciousness is the real. The reflected consciousness is what Advaita, the teaching of non-duality, 
invites us to discard. By letting the riti alone prevail, that simple awareness, and that's all you can say. The next verse is rather interesting and very necessary to understand in this. Thought moves from one object to another. And you might notice this. You may have the best of intentions in this lecture. I'm, I'm going to listen very hard. <laughs> I'm really going to listen. He says this is difficult. I'm, I'm going to give my full attention, you think. But have a look. See if the attention is distracted. Someone yawns next to you, or you hear some snoring, or traffic in the road. The text says, thought moves from one object to another. Yet, in between thoughts, beyond the thoughts, there is that condition which is beyond change and with no support. And find that now, that condition, which is beyond change, that condition which has no support. It's called unmani, beyond the mind. And here we go beyond the vritti. Here we go beyond the mind. And again, all the spiritual practices we have received are designed to operate in this way. Well, a few things happened to me in the last a um, few months, which I thought might be helpful with regard to this. Uh, my wife and I were coming back from America a couple of uh, months ago, and we arrived at the front door of our place where we live. We live in a mansion block, not far from here, and there's a large black door, and at the bottom there is a brass plate you know what it's like, one of these, stop you kicking the, the door, I suppose. And it's, there's a cleaner who comes every week and he buffs up the brass plate. So it's rather nice, nice and shiny. And we saw a blackbird pecking at the brass plate. And we thought, oh, crazy. Coming down the stairs the following morning, hear this tapping. open the door, it's the blackbird again. And this went on for about two months. Of course, as we know, I suspect, the blackbird sees its own reflection. It sees a rival, and so it's attacking its rival. It's obsessed with its reflection, and we are too because we indulge in this reflected consciousness all the time. It's called my world. All the experiences, all the desires, all the actions are stored there in this reflected consciousness. The individual thrives on this reflected consciousness. We have all sorts of names for it in philosophy. We analyze the mind. We have different names for it in Sanskrit, don't we? I'm sure we could all give erudite lectures on this. But essentially, whether we call it manas, buddhi, citta, ahankara, it's the mind, it's this reflector, it's like a mirror. We're looking into the mirror now, it appears. 
I remember when I was a boy, we used to go to fairgrounds. Uh, have you been to those places called, called the Hall of Mirrors? Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? The Hall of Mirrors. And it was marvellous. You would pay a small sum to go in, and you, you'd go and you'd stand in front of this mirror, and suddenly you were very, very tall, or very, very short, or very, very fat, or very, very thin. Marvellous. Well, each of our minds is like one of those mirrors. And hence, we have 200 odd different mirrors in this room. Each one is particular. And sometimes we polish up our mirrors. When we polish it up, we feel virtuous. Sometimes it gets a little bit dirty and we feel, oh yes, no, I've done something wrong. But essentially it's a mirror. It's still a mirror. Advaita invites you to do away with the mirror. Advaita invites you to be yourself. And this is the message of the eternal way. But how? Let vritti alone prevail. Let the simple awareness prevail, the simple turning. Then there is no reflected consciousness. This is the key. <coughs> well, of course, we have this right at the beginning of the Upanishads. Om. Isha wasya medagna sarvang yat king cha jagat yang jagat. All this, whatever is moving on the earth, should be covered by the self. It's the same message. Let vritti alone prevail. Let the self alone prevail. Here I've got a confession to make. We've cheated a little bit in the translation. It really says, let thought alone prevail. But somehow, we couldn't put that. <laughs> so we've cheated. We've said, let thought of absolute alone prevail. Okay, I'm going to try to justify ourselves. <laughs> If you do away with the reflected consciousness, then the thought must be absolute thought. It can't be individual thought. So that's our justification anyway. But the text does say, let thought alone. Never believe a translator. <laughs> Always be cautious. Look at, look at the Sanskrit yourself. That's, that's my advice. Otherwise you're being conned. <laughs> Dear, yes, gosh, and that reminds me. Uh, I was writing these notes for this lecture last week, and my wife was away um, in the countryside. And uh, I thought, yes, nice quiet time. I'm going to sit down, write these notes. And I thought, yes, get out my best pen. And I have this rather nice ink pen. And I thought, yes, make some neat notes. So, got out the pen. Unfortunately, I hadn't used it for a while. Uh, it was a little bit dry, you see. So I thought, I'll put the cap on, give it a good flick, you know, be all right. Still didn't work. Put the cap on, give it a good flick. Suddenly I noticed there was an arc of black, <laughs> indelible ink right across the wall, onto the uh, table, onto the white carpet, which is fairly newly laid, uh, and then, horror of horrors, the beautifully upholstered uh, new chair of my wife, uh, her treasured possession, uh, with its lovely upholstery, flicked with black indelible ink. <laughs> At this point, the reflected consciousness became <laughs> quite pronounced. 
I shan't repeat all the thoughts going through mind. <laughs> um, well, anyway, you can imagine the kind of scenario. Fortunately, about a minute later, came to mind, let thought of absolute alone prevail. <laughs> then there is no reflected consciousness. <laughs> and it was a saving grace. Because, of course, when you let the thought of absolute prevail, you just give your attention to what needs to happen, which was to get out the spray and get the ink up. My wife came home, actually, and uh, she said, oh, uh, don't worry at all. She said, that, that's shabby chic, it's good, she said. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, I'm sure there are countless, you have countless examples uh, of times when you just give your attention to what needs to take place. You do away with the reflected consciousness. You have to. There are circumstances which call it out of you. So this is what the teaching is about. Well, in a way, I, I finished the lecture uh, because that was it. <laughs> uh, because there is really only one theme here. Once you've seen the simplicity of it, this is it. Of course, there are many other verses, uh, and we could discuss them a little, but we're actually talking about the same thing. It talks, for example, about knowledge. But knowledge is born of the vritti. All knowledge is born of vritti. That applies to knowledge of Oh, there's a blue book there. But it also applies to spiritual knowledge. The statements of the scriptures are called vritti. But interestingly, in this text, it doesn't stop there. That's called jhana, knowledge. But there's also vijana. The jhana the initial knowledge, if you like, arises from the scriptures. That's in the spiritual realm, in the realm of spiritual practice. The initial knowledge arises from the scriptures. That's called the jhana. But then you get the vijana, which is knowledge in practice. And that's the real knowledge. I do remember turning up to my first philosophy lecture some decades ago, and they emphasized this. They said, oh, we're not just about philosophy. We're not about academic philosophy. We're not about just learning the theory. You have to see it in practice. And this is precisely the point which the text is making. And the vijana is pure knowledge alone. It goes beyond all vritti. At that point, the vritti dissolve. And so the vritti, let's say it's a statement from the Upanishads, one reflects upon it, but that vritti will take one beyond the vritti. And that's the pure knowledge alone. So now really, the text deals with everything which we have been introduced to, and it's quite comprehensive, but it looks at it in a very novel way. Take this verse, for example, and this cover is illustrating one of the verses, which says, in the ocean of bliss. My mind always swims playfully, like a fish, purified by bathing in the waters of right understanding. You might have seen that on the advertisement for this lecture. And that word there, understanding, is the vijana. The real purity, the real purification comes through knowledge and practice. 
not through the information. I had to pause to think about this, actually, uh, when I was on holiday recently. I always seem to talk about my holidays uh, in these lectures. Uh, but yes, we were in Florida again uh, in April. And I love swimming in the sea. So as soon as we got there, I dashed down to the shore in my swimming kit. And uh, I happened to see a few dead fish by the seashore there. But I thought, well, a few fish. Some fishermen have been here, dived in. Then I noticed that the water was rather red. And I looked around, and suddenly I noticed no one else was swimming in it at all. <laughs> and I got to get a little concerned, and then I saw there were thousands of dead fish uh, on the shore. I later discovered this was called the red tide. I don't know if people have come across this. It's the first time I'd come across it, but apparently in the Gulf of Mexico, you get this red tide every so often, and it's algae which have accumulated, and they get washed uh, onto the uh, shore, and then the fish will get poisoned. Thousands, millions probably of fish, dead fish. And this verse actually came to mind at that point. <laughs> purified by bathing in the waters of right understanding. And it struck me that these fish were not being purified by bathing in the waters of right understanding. Uh, quite the opposite. But it did strike me that the vritti, which we are exposed to, are quite mixed in this world. Some vritti, some experiences, if you like, are purifying. Some, perhaps not so some even poisonous. And our minds swim in this great ocean of bliss, but we come across different influences. And one message of the eternal way is to always seek the best influences. And it makes it very clear, as far as the eternal way is concerned, that those best influences are the Upanishads. All right, a few major themes. First of all, sacrifice. It emphasizes that in this work, this spiritual work, one of the first things is sacrifice, is service. One should cast the heart as a single offering into the light of the fire of oneself. This is the true fire sacrifice, while others are so called. And obviously the reference is to the Vedic fire sacrifice. And in the Vedic fire sacrifice, I don't know if you've ever been to one, um, they cast various offerings into the fire. I went to one in Greenford once, um, and it was a residential house, quite amazing experience actually, in the middle of um, a living room. Someone set up a fire, they had a priest, and it was a Vedic sacrifice in Greenford. And all these offerings were made into the fire, and it was explained to me that this represents the giving up of the individual impediments, the individual claims, and they are sacrificed in the sacrificial fire. And so this is what the fire sacrifice is about. But the eternal way says, one should cast the heart as a single offering into that sacrificial fire. And again, this is giving up the reflected consciousness. It's the surrender of the individual citta, the individual heart, the individual mind. It then says, this is the culmination of knowledge and realized knowledge, that's jhana and vijana. Surrender to that ever-present absolute. And this is the let vritti alone prevail. Surrender to that ever-present absolute. Another beautiful verse on the present moment, it says, 
I do not mull over anything in the past. I do not dwell upon anything in the future. Free from desire and aversion, I enjoy the here and now, whether auspicious or inauspicious. And of course, this is again precisely what certainly I heard in part one of philosophy. It then deals with the pause, and the Sanskrit word here is sandhi. It means adjoining. It says, in the pause between inactivity and activity, there the mind is desireless. One who masters this pause is without doubt free. Of course, the classic inactivity is night, and the classic activity is day. So the two pauses in between those, I'm sure you can work it out, is the dawn and the dusk, where the spiritual aspirant is asked to meditate or fall still or study and to use those sunty meeting periods between day and night. But of course, one can also introduce pauses during the day, perhaps during the night as well. <laughs> so in that pause, there the mind is desireless. In other words, it goes beyond the reflected consciousness. Study is the next subject it deals with. One should hear the words of the Upanishads and reflect on them with reasoning and continually join with them. From this comes the vision of the self. One should hear the words of the Upanishads and reflect on them with reasoning. Then continually join with them. It's no use just hearing the words of the scriptures once or twice. One keeps having to go back to them, continually joining with them. From this comes the vision of the self. Then a verse which is probably particularly important for, this is an annual language lecture. It then speaks about sound. It says, since the words of the Upanishads have a power which surpasses all thought, from these words alone come direct realization. This is the Shabda, as it's called in Sanskrit, the sound. And it refers particularly to the sound of the Upanishads. And that sound, its effect, its power, is beyond thought, it says. So although we need to certainly study the words of the scripture, in the end, we have to just hear the sound. It then deals with meditation. And of course, all these are really letting vritti alone prevail, whether it's resting the attention on the sounds of the scriptures, that's letting the vritti alone prevail, whether it's pausing, that's being in the present, letting the vritti alone prevail, doing away with the reflected consciousness. All these practices are really the same. Of meditation, it says, everywhere, at all times, there is a mantra vibrating in the body of living beings. Everywhere, at all times, there is a mantra vibrating in the body of living beings, knowing, I am that Supreme Spirit, one is released from all bonds. Now, that I am that Supreme Spirit is a translation of a mantra which is Hang Sah So Hum. Hang Sah So Hum. 
Saul Ham is actually another quotation from the Isha Upanishad, Sa Aham. Sa Aham. And Sa is the inward breath, Hum is the outward breath. And I was practicing this running in Battersea Park the other week. Marvelous practice. So hum, so hum. It means I am that, or that am I, that am I, that am I. Keeps you going if you're running. So so hum, so hum, so hum. And if you invert that, of course, you get a hung sa, a hung sa, a hung sa. I am that, I am that, I am that. So you get a hum sa, so hum. I am that, that am I. A hung sa so hum. And if you take away the initial a, uh, you get hung sa so hum. I am that swan. <laughs> what? Swan? Did he say swan? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, t I actually did say swan. <laughs> hung sa is a swan. And it symbolizes the supreme spirit. And that's why we've translated this I am that supreme spirit. So you might have come across that expression. Paramahangsa, Paramahangsa Yogananda. I'm sure we've all heard of that. Paramahangsa is the supreme swan. And of course, there are lots of stories about swans. Uh, one of my favorite stories, actually, is about a swan. And if you start reading Sanskrit literature, the, one of the first stories you normally come across is about a swan. So this is a story, it's a love story. Uh, it's the story of Nala and Damayanti. There is a king called Nala. He's very handsome, very accomplished. And a beautiful princess called Damayanti. She lives in a nearby kingdom. They hear of each other's qualities. Nala hears of Damayanti's beauty. Damayanti hears of Nala's strength, courage, handsome visage, etc. And in this way, without seeing each other, they hear report of each other's virtues. It just so happens that Nala, who now is really lost in thought about Damayanti, having heard so much about her, is walking in the gardens of his palace. And as he walks along, he sees some swans landing. And he runs after one of them, clutches it by the neck. Stop! And the swan turns around and says, Nala! Speaking in a human voice. Please, don't harm me. If you let me go, I will tell Damayanti of your love for her. Oh, thank you, said Nala, and let him go. And off the swans went, over to the kingdom where Damayanti was, and landed, of course, in the gardens, where Damayanti was also lost in thought. <laughs> lost in vrittis and reflected consciousness, no doubt. <laughs> Thinking about Nala. <laughs> and so Damayanti was there with all her friends, and all these swans landed, and they all chased after the swans. One was a bit slow, it's the same one, actually. She got hold of it. Stop! She caught it by the neck. The swan turned around, speaking in a human voice. Please, Damayanti, don't harm me. I have a message for you. <laughs> King Nala is in love with you. Oh, said Damayanti, tell him that I also love him. And in this way, of course, the message got back to Nala, the swans flew back. In this way, they heard about each other, even though they'd never seen each other. And of course, this is the work of the swan. And the swan is present in this room. It's beyond the individuals. It is the supreme spirit. It is the great communicator. It is the great unifier. It is the one self of us, of us all. Well, we've talked a lot about letting the vritti alone prevail, the thought of absolute alone prevail. We haven't done much about those reflectors, have we? Those mirrors. 
How to be free of those mirrors? Yes, we can certainly take the positive route of letting the attention rest precisely where it needs to rest. We've been at this for decades, haven't we? In work sessions, giving precise attention to the present moment, precisely where the work is taking place, that's letting vritti alone prevail. Letting go of the reflected consciousness. But what about those reflectors? What about those mirrors? Those mirrors of the mind, those myriad mirrors which we've nurtured over we don't know how long. Not this, not this. This is the next spiritual discipline and it's again, it's precisely on the same point. You are not the body, says the text. That's one of the main reflectors we have. You are not the senses. You are not the life force. You are not the mind. You are not the intellect. For all these, like a pot, are subject to change, will be destroyed, and can be observed. These are the three tests. If something will change, if something will be destroyed, if something can be observed, it cannot be you. It's like a pot. Our bodies are like pots. Our senses are like pots. Our life force is like a pot. Our mind is like a pot. We're all potty. <laughs> I went to a lecture once on this. <laughs> this fellow, it's very funny, guru it was, he said, you're all potty. <laughs> and this is what he meant. You're like a pot. You're subject to change. If you think you're the body, if you think you're the mind, you're subject to change. You will be destroyed and you can be observed. So you cannot be any of those things, not really. And the next verse, having performed that not this, not this, it says, you are that non-dual supreme, which is the one highest bliss, pure knowledge alone, taintless and without distinction. Well, this is England, and we shouldn't go away without talking about the weather. Um, let's talk about the weather now, shall we? Uh, <laughs> because the text does, it finishes by talking about the weather, funny enough. And funny enough, it's very similar to the weather we are, we're having last week, thunderstorms. It says, in the sky of consciousness, which is being and bliss, in the sky of consciousness, which is being and bliss, come the cloud of illusion and the lightning mind. So we get this cloud of illusion and the lightning mind coming with it. The feeling of I is thunder and thoughts, torrents of rain, and these are the vritti. The individual vritti, presumably the ones backed up by reflected consciousness, which pour down. Then it says, in the darkness of great delusion, the divine pours down playfully, but then the key. To bring that rain to an end, there is the one wind of awakening. Thank goodness for the wind, it blows away the clouds, and one's left again with this sky of consciousness which is being and bliss. 
Okay, well, time is ticking on. Uh, I was a little bit guilty in these lectures because it's, it's, it's billed as the annual language lecture, and I always end up talking about non-duality, <laughs> which, of course, is what I really love. But I suppose, really, what I'm saying here is I think we all in this room actually really love the teaching of non-duality. That's why we are here. The question is how best to access that teaching of non-duality. And of course, personally speaking, I have found the best way of accessing it is through this wonderful Sanskrit language. And all what we've heard has come directly from the Sanskrit language, nowhere else. So all I would say is we've attempted to make the Sanskrit as accessible as possible in this book uh, and just invite you to have a look at it. Not everyone's a great pundit of Sanskrit. But it is worthwhile accessing what we can from the original text as best we can. Because the real knowledge comes directly from the Sanskrit text. That's where it's coming from. As I said before, uh, these translators, uh, they're conning you, really. Don't believe a word they say. <laughs> See for yourself. Go back to the original. That's the way to really access the wisdom. So this lecture has been all about language. Most of it's been in the English language, but it's come directly from the Sanskrit language. And you have the ability also to go back to that Sanskrit language. We all do. And the more we can access the wisdom of that Sanskrit language, the more the teaching of Advaita will be clear and the more that teaching is clear, the more the teaching as a whole will go out to everyone where it is needed. I can't resist finishing with a story. I hope you'll pardon me. But <laughs> it's one of my favorite stories. And it is relevant, actually. <laughs> Once upon a time, Manu, Manu is said to be the first man, equivalent of Noah. Once upon a time, Manu was walking along beside a river, and he heard a little squeaky voice, Manu, Manu, help me, help me. What, said Manu, what's that? A little fish was poking its head up from the river, the river Ganges. Manu, Manu, I'm a little fish, and I'll be swallowed by the big fish unless you save me. All right, said Manu, feeling rather compassionate. He crouched down, picked this little fish up, little goldfish it was, put it into a bowl, a little pot he had with some, some water. Oh, thank you, said the fish. Swam around very playfully, just like that fish on the front cover, actually. Manu, Manu, I'm a little hungry. Could you feed me a bit? Oh, yes, of course, got some fish food fed the fish. Manu went to sleep that night. Next morning, heard this little voice again. Manu, Manu, help me, help me. The fish had grown as large as the pot. <laughs> it was sort of bursting almost. All the water had been displaced. Manu, Manu, I need a, a larger container, please, please. Oh, all right, all right, said Manu. <coughs> took the container, tipped it out into a tank. Oh, could you feed me a little, said the fish. Fed a little bit more, thought, better not feed too much, getting a bit, bit fat, this fish. Went to sleep, next morning, Manu, Manu, help 
help me, help me. Fish was as large as this tank. All the water displaced. He got some of his rishi friends, tipped the uh, tank out into a pool. Oh, thank you, Manu. I can really swim happily now in this pool. Swam around in the pool. And could I have a little fish food, please? Just a tiny little bit. Next morning, of course, the fish was as large as the pool and the, all the water had been displaced. He arranged for a crane to lift the whale-like um, fish out into the river Ganges. And, of course, the next evening, the, the fish was as large as the river itself, blocking the river. The whale-like creature now swam out to the ocean and turned around and said, Manu, I am that all-pervasive being that keeps expanding. Build an ark, and into that ark save the seven rishis, the seven sages, and the seeds of all creatures, male and female, So Manu did what he was told and built this ark. So the question is, what does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll hazard two messages which I took from this story. Building this ark to save humanity, to save the wisdom, it is working at this great study of the teaching of non-duality. The study of the Sanskrit language, the study of the great tradition which we have inherited. And that's building the ark, perhaps, we could say. It saves the wisdom of humanity. And the fish is continually expanding. And our awareness can continually expand if we let the thought of absolute alone prevail and do away with this reflected consciousness. Thank you. Thank you.